This is our Libertarian Crusaders podcast episode number four, and it's going to be on the topic of the Declaration of Independence. This is your host, Cal Moloney. John Kennedy. Kurt Bivens. Tyler Spires. And since 4th of July was just the other day, would you guys surmise that that's also a pro-gun holiday? Of course. Shooting the British. Shooting the British, right? <laughs> <laughs> if uh, we didn't have the 4th, we didn't shoot back, we'd be speaking... Um, American, right? Or <laughs> <laughs> we would have weird accents, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very much a pro-gun holiday, so it's kind of weird to see, like, even uh, during Obama's tenure, you know, a lot of these liberals coming out there being very anti-gun. It's like, well, it's kind of like uh, that remark that I forgot who said it to this British guy during the debate. It's like, you know, uh, if we didn't, you know, you're very anti-guns, but if we didn't use guns, you'd be speaking German. Right. Right. Well, you know, back then they had totally different guns that we just, uh, you know, so like technically um, we shouldn't be allowed to have, you know, AR-15s today. Right. Right. Isn't that the argument? Yeah, the, uh, they, they had no idea of the technology that could be unleashed with like semi-auto weapons and stuff. I saw that there was like a, a Gatling gun of some sort a back then, gun. right? Yeah. That these things were kind of available. Uh, they were expensive, though. Yeah. Yeah. What about the, what kind of air? Airplanes that we had back then at these airports that Trump was talking about. Uh, the good old Battle of LaGuardia. <laughs> Technically, there was air back then, and there were ports. So, you know, it's not a really much of a technical fallacy, I think. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't quite recall. what. So I didn't see the exact statement that he made. But he based, what did he say? Yeah, something to the effect of just mentioning airports or... Um, he was talking about American ingenuity. He was talking there. about like technology progressing through the era from like Alexander Graham Bell to the Wright brothers and others. He did cover like 200 years in two sentences, so that's what threw some people off. There we go. Well, so it wasn't too much of a gaffe or anything like that then? No, it was yeah. just people being literal when it was more of a figurative expression. Right. <laughs> so don't always trust the memes. Go to the source. <laughs> but of course, you're not going to find that in a Snows article. They'll just kind of ignore it and say, I don't know, maybe he did. <laughs> uh, so on that day, on the, um, apparently the declaration was written two days before. There was like some people saying like the July 2nd will be a day and memorial and people have all these festivities and celebration. Um, but for some reason, it's the 4th that's celebrated. Does anyone know why? I don't think it was ratified on the first day that they tried to pass it. All right. So it took a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now this sort of time, I think it's interesting because you have, um, something radical for its time. I know today is very easy as like ANCAPs and stuff like that talking about, yeah, you know, uh, slavery is dumb. All right. Uh, taxation is theft, uh, and all this sort of stuff. But like back then, uh, it was a different time in which like people are putting these arguments together. People are kind of pushing to civilize further, uh, things that no one's really heard much about. Uh, and I think a lot of the stuff that they're talking about in this Declaration of Independence we're going to go over is like talking about natural rights, things that are endowed by our creator, things that are inalienable, that I don't know if any other people in history has done that kind of remark or revolt against their own government to make that kind of statement. Maybe the Magna Carta was something similar. Right. right. It was a statement. It was a statement like uh, saying that people had rights and that the king wasn't totally you know dominating that there was there was a system that the law was was applied to everyone right but yeah it, it, when we look at it through our lens it's easy to say uh oh you mean these these couple of guys you know got to sign this piece of paper and that spoke for the entirety of i mean from a spooner perspective like it, it, you do have to wonder like how much did these guys really speak for all of the colonists at the time you know right so it was a very small percentage of the call colonists that would have supported them it was like less than three percent a majority of the population was loyalist and pro-british until things started going further south and then of course the majority flipped or indifferent kind of like um like during the south uh, all the politics between the north and the south there's people just minding their own business doing their own stuff and there's some guy in the south and some yankees coming in with some bandits and he's like what is going on here he's not going to like talk politics like you have to respect property rights like there's a war now there's an aggression he's going to join the south <laughs> these people are fighting back uh much less like whatever their politics are you know uh so i could see maybe that kind of being the case for a lot of this this over here people being indifferent people are shooting uh, things kind of go crazy during war and people started joining up maybe, uh, and towards the Patriot side. 
for the for that. And cost. people's first loyalty starts to become who's close to me versus who's far away. So right. When you look at like the Civil War too, it's a lot of people maybe like Robert E. Lee even who said, "Well, I'm sticking with Virginia, even if maybe I I don't want this war to happen. I still got to stick with my my team." Right. Because I think before this, uh, the time was uh, when it was pretty much always England versus France. And they get cut up in the uh, what the French Indian War. They could get cut up in a lot of war out there, in which uh, the British have to house. They house themselves. Violation of your your house. Violation of your property. Your resources. Um, it seems to be like an ongoing thing. You can't ever get out of, or much less like consent to. Because um, I'm trying to understand what were like their grievances back then for them to say, okay, this this is enough, right? Um, and I know these are representatives. For their for, from their states, um, and usually back then, I guess the people who would pass most of the laws, people who would have much to say in the legislation or of the state, would be like the upper class, right? Because it's their property that's usually being taxed. They're the ones who uh, have more of a direct relation with how the state uh, controls what they have versus everyone else. Uh, so maybe that's kind of why it was this few number as representatives, because they're kind of matching what history has always kind of been with the upper class and the state um, or now this time upper class versus uh, nobility. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, a lot of these people would, I would say sacrificed. Uh, I mean, you think they put their lives on danger, danger when they sign that document, right? right. <laughs> um, so you're pretty much telling Britain like fuck off. Right. And like, uh, who is it? Charles Carroll of Carrollton in Maryland was the only Catholic who signed. But um, part of the reason I think they let him sign was that he was very wealthy. So he was able to, a lot of these guys, can you imagine the wealthy people today signing a document like this and committing all this money and potentially getting themselves killed? Right. <laughs> for, for an idea, you know, for these I like high ideas, you know, right. Um, put their lives at risk, their fortunes taken away. And a lot of people did die. A lot, I think a lot of those people who did sign, uh, that document died. Um, so I guess there is a lot. That's interesting. They put their skin in the game. This is just a document. There are kind of real grievances occurring. Um, and I think maybe this daring to speak out was kind of tantamount to the freedom of speech uh, clause in the Bill of Rights for it to kind of come out, right? Because I think if you do speak out like this against the British government, you would be arrested. Targeted right? at least. Right. Yeah. yeah. It would be treason. Uh, so I guess you guys want to go over the, uh, the first part. We'll go over some highlights here. Yeah, I can read it. If, if yeah, you want, go for it. Yeah. If I want to start, start it off. Uh, so, you know, in Congress, July 4th, 1776, unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands, which can have connected them with another to assume among the powers of the earth, separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So I always, I always quote that anytime I'm arguing with another libertarian about neo-Confederates and Tom Woods and anybody. Right. <laughs> it's always like, <laughs> oh, there you go. There's our founding document. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think a lot of, during this time is mostly, it uh, doesn't say anything here about the United States government. All right. It just says uh, the states so far, um, you know, their own sovereignty. I don't think anyone here says like, yeah, the federal government um, in terms of their own separation. Uh, the next part I think is, is good in that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Are they, though? Uh, I guess in natural respect for body ownership, right? Natural rights to not be infringed. Right. <clears throat> Not necessarily natural abilities, but the ability to manifest a life that you can create for yourself. Right. Um, and among these rights that are unaidable are uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, endowed by our creator, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Well, I guess before that, that's sort of just been a period, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's it. That's that's all you kind of needed. Um, I think uh, that kind of denotes more of the uh, natural rights that we have, um, our ability to reason. What are our negative rights? 
enumerated, you can say in the Bill of Rights, uh, right, uh, the right to arm yourself. That's self-defense, all right? Uh, and I think this is a good area where they say creator, they're referring to God. There's a lot of people who say, well, these are unchristian men. They're more deistic. They, they think or, or something like Durst Washington made his own Bible and stuff like that. But like here in the document, you'll find that it is a uh, Christian influenced, uh, despite a lot of the uh, other people want to say. Right. I mean, they also discussed the um, you know whenever government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it. So it, it, you wonder like, did they really mean that, or you know, like as soon as a lot of these guys did take power, it became very difficult. Even John Adams, who you know signed laws into and and said, well, you can't criticize the government now, you know, the Aliens and Sedition Act, right? right. <laughs> That's a weird one. We well, yeah, the pre, but the previous sentence says like government requires consent of those being governed. So, I, I think that's an important part that gets left out with the consent and the abolishment. It really does say that you have a right to get rid of a government that's like not serving the interests of the people. How did um, Lincoln then uh, pervert those words to mean that you can't leave uh, the union? Right, because right. he's I think during the Gettysburg speech he would use some of these same words. That Jefferson used here in the Declaration, and saying um, that we're all created equal, and kind of driving back to this document to kind of perverse the idea that uh, secession is uh, is not of the consent. I guess maybe it wasn't the consent of the North, right? <laughs> there were even places in the North that wanted to secede uh, because of slavery. They saw it as so abominable that they said, "Well, we don't want to be a part of a country that has that as legal." So we, you know, we'll leave instead. All right. Uh, Quakers are tantamount to helping that. Uh, so that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. That's a key word right there. That's something you can highlight. Big yellow. Uh, when was the last time they tried to uh, alter it or abolish those ties? War of the Northern Aggression, <laughs> or um, and you know, yeah, the winner always gets to write the story, like the history. So right. we have this glorious view of the American Revolution, but any other form of challenging the U.S. government's always been met with, you know, insult. Oh, that's those people were nuts. They were crazy. So. I mean, you have like the same thing if you go back to like England, where we came from, with Oliver Cromwell overthrowing the British crown and instituting the British Commonwealth. Like, once he got thrown over and the British took back over, they painted him as a villain, and he had some revolutionary ideas of like a Bill of Rights and stuff. Right. It didn't Virginia have a Bill of Rights or something like that before that? Was it, some of the states had their own constitutions, right? Uh, Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom and then a Bill of Rights for Virginia. Yes. Okay, so there's like a lot of influence where a lot of this stuff will come from. Um, government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be exchanged for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms of which they are accustomed. What does that mean? Like they get used to it? Don't do not do this too lightly. Yeah. You know, don't take this too lightly. If it's, if it's just something you could quickly fix, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I guess the cost of it otherwise is war. <laughs> is people dying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when a train, when a long train of abuses and usurpations, uh, pursuing invariably the same object, invests a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government, and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patience and sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessities which constrain them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, usurpations, and all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this fact, let facts be submitted to a candid world. So, 
I guess this is their, what, is it 95 or 97 thesis that uh, Luther put up there? <laughs> right, they're, yeah, they're nailing this to the wall. I got to wonder, you know, what it, somebody should make a movie about that, is uh, King George, like, receiving this and just being totally aghast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think they printed, like, 200 of these documents and just kind of spread them all over the colonies and stuff like that, the states. Mm. Uh, and in here, when they see the states, they look at... Um, the states as like direct mirror or as like the Britain as a state. They look as kingdom England as a state. They look at their own Virginia as their own sovereign state. A Westphalian nation state. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so here comes the interesting parts. And I want to look at uh, the stuff that they call to be a just cause for war and independence <laughs> and see if this is what we have today and uh, look at that reflection. So he says, uh, he, the King, King George, he has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So assent is when the king would sign it after it had been passed by a legislature. It was his approval. All those had to have royal assent to go into law. So he would refuse. So you could say, uh, well, like video, vetoing majority rules, majority laws that would come in. So it's not much of a veto. Uh, the legislature more existed at the king's grace. So, like, it's not exactly the same relationship, but it has the same effect. Mm -hmm. So, like, this is something they wanted and the king just wouldn't sign it? Yep. It could be something as simple as, like, they wanted to build a road and the king would say it's not really my problem and ignore it. But it's a needed road. Right. Uh, I guess kind of maybe similar to uh, what happened in... Uh what was the state where the Democrats are trying to get these Republicans to come in and Oregon, Oregon, Oregon and vote in these laws and right. they're assent to laws like, well, we're not going to, you can't vote if you don't have enough people in there to vote. I mean, I guess that's a good thing. I don't know. Check the balances. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend them to them. So yeah, they, the colonial governors didn't have the ability to, like, like improv. If something came up that had to immediately be answered, they would have to wait for the king's agent to tell them, like, what to do on it. That'd so, take forever. Yeah, when you're talking about wooden <laughs> ships, crossing the Atlantic and getting the king to answer and all, right. all that stuff. It's, like, different from, like, sending crows from, like, Game of Thrones. <laughs> and then you get the yeah. crow, you just sign yeah. it. And in one episode, they, oh. they, they <laughs> across the continent. The don't, response is, like, who's this? Who this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't they wish that they had the modern technology that we have today so that it would be so much easier? I mean, as the U.S. government is showing to run, manage an empire, you know. To right. They probably would have kept the, the empire had they been able to yeah. communicate instantly. It have been a lot more efficient. Um, and there's that uh, Hoppe argument saying that uh, things were, were better when you do the cost-benefit analysis of a democracy where everyone's their king and you're the slave of everyone versus one king where it's hard for him to pass any laws because everyone knows who's responsible for everything, right? All the blame is put onto one person. Right. Um, so, yeah, uh, that would be difficult, I guess. And I can't imagine, like, states trying to do their own stuff and then they have to wait months to hear word that it's okay for them to do it. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless these those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. So I know they weren't a few. The Crown wasn't a huge fan of like uh, Virginia had like the House of Burgesses, which was the first elected uh, legislature in the Western Hemisphere, and they weren't a huge fan of like self rule, and that's where like the whole like taxation without representation came, thing came up because they weren't a fan of us like you know making our own laws right that leads to rebellion <laughs> you don't want like, another hey, what, we're the lawgivers <laughs> we, you're not, that's not your job you don't want another ireland and <laughs> scotland in your hands well that was their i mean the the great britain would go around and see these places as like a cash cow and so once they start separating themselves it's it's like, whoa, my investment is getting messed up. Like, this was supposed to be just my personal realm. You know, right. it wasn't supposed to, you weren't supposed to be having Americans send a representative to parliament or something like that. Right. You know? And that's a good point. I guess that'll be uh, like a secession, and no one's allowed here to create our own rules by consent. Uh, and that'd be impossible. That'd be, that'd be wrong to do. 
I think I think Great Britain learned from it though ultimately in in the 19th century just that they could they could okay now we can have like dominions and like Canada or or Australia and they can have some measure and as long as they keep the the queen as the head of state you know do you think that only happened ground. because like say the American revolutionary failed right then you wouldn't have maybe Canada trying to do the same thing and it would be because it led a domino effect of other countries thinking, well, maybe we could do it too. Uh, it bankrupt France for sure and led France to kind of mirror America. And then that led to the rise of like Napoleon and uh, everything else that followed. Um, a weird what if. Yeah. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable. <laughs> What? And distance from the depositor of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. That's a good strategy. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot like what um, modern political parties do with Robert's rules and various little techniques that they all use to uh, wear away at people so that they stop challenging motions and, and may, you know keep people there longer, um, just annoy the hell out of them. Right. Going by just finding the loopholes and uh, praying on that. That's right. clever. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly <laughs> firmness his invasions on the right of the people. So the monarch always had the right to dissolve a parliament anytime they felt the need to do so, but repeatedly doing it is probably what pissed them off. <laughs> hmm. uh, stop with your public uh, assembly. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. Hmm. Yeah. So, failing to protect them, perhaps. I, I know they go on to discuss um, being attacked by tribes and, and what right. have you. In North America, and its independent states were still having border disputes by that time. You know, Virginia claimed everything to California, right? Really? North, yeah, we had a claim to everything up to Michigan, to California, and Massachusetts. <laughs> wow! I know. Wow! Imagine that! Wow, Virginia could have been so great. <laughs> Virginia's original charter actually did it legally give us all of it. So, yeah, going back to tradition also means going back to the original charters, charters and kind of bringing that up. I don't want California. <laughs> no, we, we, no, we kick out the California. <laughs> we cut that out. <laughs> they can have that part. <laughs> Charity. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. So it goes kind of along the same thing of preventing people to have their own legislation and Resolving their own disputes. Right. Right. Yeah, he didn't want us having our own court system. All right. <clears throat> kind of like what the, the current state does. How dare you have alternative courts. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. He's made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment for their salaries. Salaries. Federal funded judges. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now we're on to stuff that's similar here. Yeah. <laughs> They're very hard to fire. Well, I mean, <laughs> and to be a Supreme Court justice, you have to. Be I will say that most of the, the issues president. that we currently have with the judiciary are an overreaction from the position they're in because he's talking more about like literally, if he didn't like you as a judge, he could just pay you less. Right now with the federal judge, it is more of an independent scale system. And then the whole like life of t tenure thing was replacing the whole he could dismiss a judge anytime he wanted to. Maybe we went a little bit further in the wrong direction. But now what are they coming up with? Bernie Sanders talking about stacking the stacking the court. Yeah. Right. So there's always gonna be a way a workaround. What does that mean stacking the court? Packing the court, filling the Supreme Court full yeah. of people that support your interests. So uh, right. FDR threatened to do it. Right. That's right. why they passed Social Security. Well, we got one more to go. Ruth uh, Ginsburg. So <laughs> see how that works out. 10,000 years of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their <laughs> substance. What is that? So that that's sounds like... The stamp so bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds really annoying. <laughs> IRS. That sounds like your city council. 
Um, okay. Voice. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, he has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislators. Yeah. It's amazing to think about the way that the founding fathers thought about standing armies and then to look at today <laughs> and just look at the police. Never mind. Never mind the military. But just look at the police and uh, think, wow. That's like what, a standing army think? right now. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, almost every federal agency has a SWAT team. But. NASA's looking to buy some like <laughs> rifles. <laughs> what is going on? What does NASA know that we don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Space Force. <laughs> Every revenge on the bugs. I mean, there's no ban on of space. There's no ban on space forces in here. So, I mean, that seems fine to me. You know. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, standing armies will kind of be like uh, the militarized police that we have today. I would see that. Uh, standing armies, like you can look at, like again, this goes back to states being sovereign and stuff like that. You have your national guard, you have your uh, sovereign uh, uh, people, uh, militias. But then compare that to like the federal government standing armies, and those standing armies are like eight hundred bases all over the world, <laughs> occupational force, okay, right. right, right, and nuclear weapons, that, nuclear weapons that are ready at all times, of course. I mean, I could see like when they go out to the well, the Strait of Gibraltar and kind of fire these. Uh, pirates because they're kidnapping Europeans and putting them into slavery and doing like these humanitarian missions. Sure. Boom. But you don't like stay there and establish a base and like live there for like the next, you know, 10, two decades, right? And they came back. Uh, he has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. So I guess this is just foreign people meddling in our affairs, pretty much. And not, uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of like the federal government telling our, like, California's going into legislation and dictating what Virginia should do, sort of thing, through the federal so government. Like Russia interfering with our election? All right. Have you heard about that? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the United States government interfering in other people's elections. That's different. <laughs> it's okay when we do that <laughs> haven't you learned manifest destiny for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us yeah I don't even like the people I live with voluntarily so I would not be cool with that either <laughs> which one is that that's the third amendment uh, to be quartering soldiers quartering soldiers I, I think so it. right <laughs> I, th I think that one in a way kind of you can deduce from that saying that you have a right to privacy Right, you have a right. Uh, like a uh, man's house is his own castle. Uh, he has a right. No one has a right to kind of invade that or interfere with that or violate that kind of property. Um, I don't know how many Supreme Court cases the Third Amendment has ever come up for that. That's alien to me. Probably next, maybe a few. I mean, it's bad enough that the people that lived in your house. But the crazy part was like you were expected to feed them and stuff. So like back in the day, like that would have been tough because you were broke as shit. Like, I mean, you're a 17th century farmer, and you're dealing with like a Gaston that puts his muddy boots on your chair. And <laughs> why Gaston? He's just gobbling down eggs. Right. <laughs> I was like, All right, I guess my kids won't eat this week. <laughs> Apparently, it was a, a very serious, trivial thing that happened that uh, they had to put it in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I just take your room for the night. I'm, All right, I guess I'll sleep in the barn. Yeah. yeah. For protecting them by mock trial. For, well, wasn't there a thing about saying that that they wanted this to be permissible because I guess they weren't paying so much for these British troops to kind of protect them from the French and Native Ameri American Indian attacks and things like that? I think that was their argument for this sort of stuff. Mm. For like, for having these people there and protecting you, this is this will be like the cost. For protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. Yeah, that was a big deal after the uh, Boston massacre, and they had like a essentially what we have today with police officers that murder innocent people of like sham kangaroo courts that just declare that it was in self defense or it didn't really matter and just declare the officers and or soldiers innocent. Right. Didn't that start with a snowball fight? Yes. And they shot an unarmed crowd. Yeah. 
That's not going to make people happy about that. I remember seeing a video in D.C. There was a cop who somebody threw a snowball at him and he pulled the gun out. And waved it around yeah. and shit. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> My funniest, the funniest one, I don't know, maybe it's in Detroit, somewhere in Michigan, where this cop is uh, going through a place where everyone's having water gun sport fight wars. And they unload on the cop. Yeah, and the cop is like, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's spraying, like trying to get in his car. <laughs> Um, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. So Britain at the time had a mercantilist system. You actually had to buy all of your goods from Great Britain. So even if like France and other places, like even the Caribbean, you had to buy it through a British intermediary that would charge you out the ass for it so that you could then buy it in America. And that was part of their justification for all the troops and stuff in America with like the Virginia Company and the East India Trading Company and all those types of things. That's right. I think there was something where, like, you can produce the raw goods, they have to make it, and they sell it back to you. But sometimes you couldn't produce these goods yourself. You couldn't make intermediate or fine goods. There was this um, house I saw, and um, what's the name of that town where they hung witches? Salem. Yeah. <laughs> so there was, uh, like, wood that they would have to send to Britain. Like, But if the wood was a certain width, you couldn't keep that in your house. That had to be sent overseas for like their ships and stuff like that. So it was a very uh, act of like treason or rebellion <laughs> for someone in their house. And some people would do that purposefully to make sure like uh, their tables were in longer width of dimension of, uh, I guess, the described width of that wood you're allowed to have. And yes, you kind of just show like, yeah, I could do this. And, uh, you know, fuck the British. <laughs> <laughs> I went to one of these like historical museums and they had like this little thing outlined there. It's like that was awesome. Um, but isn't that isn't this what government does? I mean, all the time is is it's setting up special trade agreements with various countries around the world, and well, all right, you sell us this much, and we'll sell you that much, and and um, so in a, in a sense, I mean, they're they're organizing trade to this day. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's it it is less of a deal now with like the internet like democratizing things i can yeah i can buy things on the internet from a from almost every country besides north korea if i wanted to yeah back then it was like you were literally committing treason if you probably didn't buy it from the british you were gonna get hemmed up Ooh, right. yeah yeah for imposing taxes on us without our consent well there you go yeah that's right. what we're going right <laughs> <laughs> rebellion guys <laughs> <laughs> And then, yet, what is one of the first things George Washington does? Is the whiskey rebellion? Thing like twenty five percent tax on whiskey. <laughs> oh. Daddy had to come beat us with a belt. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad behavior yeah. to drink alcohol. Yeah, I guess like that kind of took uh, worse for wear there, and a weird turn in that direction. Um, and what were taxes back then? Were like like one two percent? Wasn't even that high. Yeah. What would they think of today? Income tax? Where do I see that in the Constitution? That's how the income tax started, right? All right. Just, uh, oh, this is just going to be on the rich. Technically, there's no law that says you have to pay income tax. Uh, I, I looked up this video of this guy who... I've got a book. We can do it. I've got... Um... <laughs> okay, Erwin Schiff. <laughs> <laughs> I have an original copy of Erwin Schiff's book, The Great Tax Hoke, with his uh, with original newsletters from the 80s in it. You too can go to a prison and die there. <laughs> Strapped to a gurney, yeah. Wow. Well, for depriving, de depriving us in many cases of the benefit of trial by jury. I guess during this time, this is a high trust society. You know your family, you know the people in your community. And some other places, like, I don't know these people. I don't know if I want to gamble with... Uh... <laughs> yeah, just because a mob votes to make you go, okay, I'm not sure I would feel better about right. it. Right. Yeah, plenty of uh, plenty of people who are charged with stuff will just ask for a bench trial, right? So right. <clears throat> sometimes it's better. During prohibition, it was good because a lot of them were just you wanted a trial by jury, and they always just said not guilty. There was one in which they just drink the evidence in secret when they kind of they would say, "Well, what's the evidence?" Like, "Well, okay, here's the evidence. Hey, we want to see if there's the evidence of him violating pro prohibition." And so they deliberated. They came back and said, "Yeah, where's the evidence?" <laughs> 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 Lost in the boating accident. <laughs> <laughs> Not guilty. <laughs> well, also, this presents an opportunity for nullification, which would enable you to have your friends get you off, even if it was a legitimate charge. Right. And it was probably true. You could still have whoa, whoa, people you in your town. You shouldn't use the word legitimate charge. Just because something's a charge and you did it doesn't make it legitimate. 
Well, like, you know, if you actually did it, right? And they have overwhelming evidence against you. And my favorite it's a victimless crime. But if it's a victimless crime, then... Right. It, my, yeah. Then my your favorite jury lawyer, just says he's not guilty. My favorite lawyer from Tennessee has a sign that says, just because you did it doesn't mean you're guilty. Nice. That's, that's a good lawyer. That's the kind of lawyer you want. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> for depriving us in many cases... Well, I already said that. Uh, for transporting us be, beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. Huh. Well, I guess that kind of enumerates the, the rest of these. Well, so they did just uh, take these people overseas to try yeah. them? Put you on a boat, take you back to England, put you on trial. <laughs> wow. Or <That's>... they or <laughs> they would say that you're a British sailor that deserted and just bar you for the rest of your life. Oof. For abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging... It's boundaries so as to render it at once an example of fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. I think that's talking more about Canada. Because, like, in the American colonies, they had set up more of their own different types of government, with Virginia having its own, like, legislature, and Maryland having that Catholic thing they had going on, and then the Puritans running Massachusetts. I, I do think Can Canada had always been more centrally ruled. When did uh, Britain take over Canada? When they lost the war with the French or something, is that? No, they beat the French and the French and Indian. Yeah, 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 that's right. And then they allowed French culture to stay there and just made they a mess of it. They didn't allow them to stay there. They kind of forced them into specific areas, safe zones, safe spaces. Ah, uh, nice. There we go. <laughs> they kind of look down on anybody that comes from outside of that culture if you wander in there now. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's to show that multiculturalism this doesn't work. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering, fundamentally, the forms of our government. For suspending our own legislator and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. Well, I guess that just kind of goes without saying. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. So I know that Locke used the abdicating government part as like one of his largest reasons why overthrowing the British was legitimate. Because they declare war on you. <laughs> well, besides that, like the, since the government was neglecting them, he felt the neglect was an, a, a just enough reason to overthrow a government. There you go. Yeah, there does seem to be. Here's a here's a alternative argument that there seems to be a lot of complaining that. We're trying to get stuff done over here, and he's not allowing us to have, you know, laws or participate in government. It's almost like I get a sense that it's, we want to have big government too, you know, or we want to have our reins on the powers of government, and we're not being allowed to, you know. It's kind of a, a debate that, granted, they, they sought for a Republican democracy rather than a... Um, Monarchy? You know, yeah, but still, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. But, like, say in Kapistan, we have our own town and stuff like that. How would we draw up our own charters, right? And I imagine we, if we all live in the same community, we'd give consent to this kind of stuff together. And it would kind of mirror a lot, you can say, like uh, the way a private company runs a gated community, a golf course community or something like that. Because um, I found, like, government tends to hijack a lot of what the private sector does. And then people kind of, the two become blurred. In the way of, um, like some people say there's voluntary government. I don't like to confuse people with that, but I could see where they would come with that. Um, and I could see, well, I mean, this is a separate, I guess, topic. At one point, we should do something on secession, but uh, I, I think it's great for competing governments to kind of emerge because at least uh, panarchy, like right. that, you know, people can move to where they agree the most. Right. And with that kind of, competition creates like a market competition of ideas and better rules and better taxes you can say and then people will say well why can't i also secede and then boom pretty much all the counties in virginia secede from one another Liechtenstein, yeah everywhere right um and then cancer is easier to be manageable when it's really small to to treat that right right yeah he has plundered our seas ravaged our coasts burnt our towns oh, Jesus, and destroyed the lives of our people I mean, that's that's sort of been like number one up there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this happening to a group of people around 1865 between like Atlanta and like Charleston, getting all their stuff burned. 
By the British? Sherman's March to the Sea. No, by the Americans. What? what? Sherman. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Sociopath. Yeah. Wow, wow. Mass murderer. I mean, there we go. When we write our declaration, you know, we include that charge of the federal government doing that historically to the American people. Yeah. Huh. But, like, you know, it's interesting. It's like uh, thinking about this. You're just thinking about a bunch of guys who are kind of brainiacs talking about high ideas. But... They're sending a letter to the guy who owns all the weapons, like who runs all the, has the monopoly on force. All right. And uh, uh, you, you look at somebody like Sherman, he, and he's like, oh, yeah, but by the way, like, I've still got the monopoly. I'm the guy who's got the monopoly on force in, in Georgia and Virginia. And, or so I don't really think that he had the monopoly of force. Sure, he de facto, on paper, owned the weapons, but they were all in the communities and they were independently controlled. So it's it's definitely not like the relationship today where, like, the government definitely controls ICBMs that it can blow your town up with. It was definitely more federated. So you, right. people had a lot more rights over them. But it was still treason, right? So yeah. ultimately, you know that this guy is the, the protector. You know, he's the he's the one who runs the army. But. Oof, yeah. Uh, what do they call this? Scorch Earth policy? Mm-hmm. Oof. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries. These are the Germans? The Hessens. There we go, man. To, isn't that uh, the Hessens involved in that um, uh, Ichabob Crane? Yes, they call him. There we go. To complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstance of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled, paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. Yeah, I mean, that... Kind of would be weird to have like foreign armies in your hometown. I imagine it's it's one of the things that despots do to protect themselves. Really, is like uh, well, I mean, he, these people weren't these Hessians weren't necessarily protecting the king, but it's very convenient to have foreign soldiers who don't really have a connection to the people that are being ruled. And so, like the Praetorian Guard was an example of a group of soldiers who protected the king and. He spoke with them, and nobody else could get to them. Hmm. The Vatican yeah. with a Swiss card, right? That's yeah. a there's a good uh, Sabaton song about that. Yeah, he has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the execu- executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hand. It's like forcing them to rebel. What? Bribing them to kill their people. Mm. Fratricide. Or was this was this related to the issue of um, they would take sailors onto their ships and forcibly conscript them? Impressment. Yeah. yeah. Is that like uh, Shanghaiing them? I think that came later. They would literally go on the ship and they would ask you how to say specific words. And if you said it the British way versus the American <laughs> way, they would drag you on their ship and say that you're British. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Which is crazy because it wasn't that much longer after like the colonies had been founded. So you better hope you say it the right way. Oh wow! What is it like? It's like that's a net, governor. Like, just... <laughs> Cheerio! <laughs> His excited domestic insurrections among us, and has endeavored to bring in inhabitants of our frontier, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Yes, the king was totally about winning regardless of uh, whatever means he needed to win, so he would totally use the na- native population like he did with the French and Indian War to right. d- defeat him if he needed to. Yeah, there was a lot of sculpting involved with that. Uh Yeah, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for a redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only with repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Wow, that's uh, that's got to hurt, Sting, when you read that. You know, like the king reading that about himself. <laughs> are, this, are those all the addresses? That is, that's all the grievances. So it seems like most of them seem to be... Uh, against uh, militarization, most of this seems to be more against the uh, British military and their involvement with their day-to-day lives and their neighbors, the Indians, and kind of putting them into like 
weird places they don't normally want to be in. Um, and a lack of consent. Right. That and the whole, like, I want to I want to control the levers of power. Right? I mean, th- yeah, I, I do get that sense. It's like, you meet the old boss, same as the new boss. Like, uh, picture Alexander Hamilton getting involved in this and excited and can't wait until he's <laughs> he's involved in getting... Uh, his hands all over the, you know, the treasury and central banking. And yeah, I do think it's important at this point, they weren't sure that they were going to break away yet until they did pass it. And then they weren't sure what the government that they were going to build looked like. It could have been a monarchy. It could have been a Republican government. They, they really weren't sure yet. looks like, um, maybe that all of these kind of problems that they have with, uh, American Indians and everything seems like they could better address it themselves than having to wait, months to hear from a king to like yeah was like well uh that town already got died you know <laughs> they already got butchered so you know the response is uh, great but it's you know it's kind of a little bit too late um we have our own arms we could have addressed it ourselves you know sure you know and that sort of thing they should have just built a wall oh no just <laughs> build a wall have the indians pay for it <laughs> <laughs> will they pay for it with though <laughs> lambskin sculpts or, <laughs> what is it so the uh, the well, I mean, the rest of this here says, uh, "Nor have we been wanting an attention to our br- British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of t- attempts by their legislator to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. Uh, but immigration settlement, I think that's the key word, is a nation of settlers, not immigrants. Uh, there is nothing here before that. I mean." Yeah, some tribes, but I think most of them kind of were wiped out by diseases, and it wasn't like, well, anyway, it's a separate topic. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpa- ur- usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we would as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war and peace, friends. You want to finish off? Yeah. So we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world, and notice Judge is capitalized with a J, uh, of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name, by the authority of the pe- good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states that they're absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may have right to do. And for the the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So you have all these guys who uh, get who end up signing, and uh, you can check it out on I'm sure online. One thing that you mentioned in the last paragraph, the spelling is very interesting. Like when it talks about United States, like the states is what they're emphasizing there, not that they're united like one government, and then they do it again in another spot too. Right. So in the beginning of the first sentence, we therefore the representatives of the lowercase United States. Right. So they're not here saying anything about a federal government. They're here acknowledging the sovereign of these states to conduct their own affairs, to conduct their own businesses, to um, willow their own people and not to kind of converge them all into this uh, empire themselves. Yeah. You mentioned Lincoln earlier. That's one of the big things that he was smart to do with his speech is that he switched it from united lowercase u to these united capital u states so he took it from independent states federating together in an alliance to it being one like hegemony like it's always been one state yeah I mean, there's not a history of that right plus like if you read the last paragraph it talks about like independent states in all caps too right emphasizing that they're not just one new state so the 50 states could the the this and the United States use this to kind of keep pushing for their own independence, all right? Mm-hmm. Going back to the wording that the delegations came in agreement to uh, to declare their independence. Um, 
Yeah, now, do you ever struggle with with uh, some ANCAPs or whoever who say, well, that's not good enough? I mean, just ha- splitting up the states, you know, and for each of them being able to separate peacefully, that's not good enough because then you still have a state, right? Each of those are a state. Right. The uh, So what they don't know is, like, there, there's a strategy that I like about secession. Uh, and I support all secession, uh, even if it leads to a state. Because the thing is, if one territory even within the 50 states or even if a state secedes from the federal government but even if like a state splits in two or some indian nation has their own state that sets off like a domino effect of other people saying well why not us why not me why not the amish all right why not any other indian native tribes um you've allowed you've granted them to do this so why can't we also follow suit and do the same thing Right. And then boom, now you have your thousands of Lichtensteins. Boom. Now it's easier than to have um, a market competition of favorable laws, of uh, favorable taxes. Eventually, one will say, like, look, no taxes. <laughs> uh, we, we see what happens where there's less taxes and things skyrocket to the moon. Right. You look at um, Hong Kong uh, and, and, and their system of uh, Western world, they left it virtually untouched and they turned from an island of. Um, uh, sweatshops to an island of skyscrapers and they always talked about like well what if we don't have natural resources we have to you have it so we're gonna have to come and take yours like hong kong has none neither yeah. does japan and right minus some dark periods of time they've traded for it right yeah <laughs> so any place could technically but it's usually just like the policies that they have um and more in the direction of free markets um and individual freedoms that they find a burgeoning amount of success and and progress um so i think that's something people don't see they think like you just want to establish another state they don't see the effects that what could have what would would have right. when if that's ever allowed to be permitted i think it's weird that i mean like the the amish what well, they don't have to pay social security taxes all right they're allowed to take their kids out uh, at the age of like 10 or 12 or something like that I mean, at the maybe even younger uh they have they enjoy interesting privileges uh to avoid themselves from the state that i wonder like why can't we also enjoy the same thing so that's the strategy of secession that a lot of people don't see the bigger picture of it they kind of are kind of narrowed scoped within that uh that it leads to more secession movements and it leads to more inevitably to the kind of freedom that we want i mean it's, it's a one form of strategy there's a lot of different ways they say well if the um, the dollar collapses, well, there you have secession again. If uh, people if you let Oregon secede, well, great, you have more secession. There's different ways to kind of go through that, and that's just one path that kind of leads to the same direction that we want to go. What right. do you think of secession? Yeah, I'm very pro secession. Right, yeah. <laughs> but more you, choice is always better. Yeah, All right. But you look at the U.S. here in this instance, though, and you know, what did you see but a consolidation of power after they seceded from Great Britain? So, ideally, people like Jefferson would have been listened to, and they they would have been their ideas would have won the day, and then he would have essentially said, "Yeah, these are all independent nations." I mean, it seemed like is what he was going for, but right. That's why uh, I was I was telling you earlier I celebrate um, Articles of Confederation Day. Uh, it's I think is a great document. Uh, didn't particularly work well for the federal government or much to their size, unfortunately. Was it a bad thing? Right, no, right. <laughs> I think that was a great thing. <laughs> What's weird though is that people look at George Washington thinking that he's credited for like creating this terms of office, They're like, well, all right, that's enough of me ruling. But technically, there were eight other presidents before him under the Articles of Confederation, and they all chose to just do one year of term in office. And so they're the ones who started the the ritual of doing unlimited terms until like FDR came in and just commied everything up. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I guess this leads into, of course, the American Revolutionary War. Was it worth it? Uh, I definitely think that it was overall worth it. It moved the ball in the right direction and it did lead to some, it was a more positive revolution if you compare it to places like France that tried it. Did not go well there. Well, you see, like, the reason France revolution occurred is because they got bankrupt funding the american revolution yeah. they were so sour against england that they wanted to give him a black eye so hard that they bankrupt 
everything uh, and led to all this uh, chaos that ensued there in the French Revolution with uh, tens of thousands of Catholics being murdered too because they wouldn't give their allegiance to the state. People don't even talk about that. Um, and then led to this vacuum of where Napoleon comes into charge and just kind of dominated all of Europe. Uh, so is uh, the American Revolution the first Vietnam? Oh, because, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, they, French funding us. Right. Then, yeah. Uh, <laughs> getting over them. They're sending their Navy, which would have, was instrumental. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. So always kind of think about like, yeah, some like we look at Venezuela. Yeah. Venezuela, you do you. You know, people are like, yeah, should we get involved? People are like, yeah, we should and let them have their own independence. But then I look like, well, we had some involvement in ours. I mean, the kind of friends were, were kind of there and helped with a major battle in another region and help roll that down. I think you can't defeat uh, an idea whose time has come. And, and so in, in Venezuela, you know, like if they're ready for a free government, you know, or a real, um, real freedom, then they won't end up with uh, – it'll just be impossible to stop the average right. person from making that happen. So from what I've read in some literature on this subject, like – the important part is like the revolution has to be supported by the people and it has to come from within. Nobody can affect that change from the outside. So if like Venezuela, the people overwhelmingly start to try to overthrow their government, but they might not have the resources to do it, then it might be successful with some outside intervention. But if they're not trying to do it like, like Iraq, the people really weren't trying to affect change to create this representative government that we imposed right. on them. They didn't want it. They didn't want it. But right. like if, in Venezuela, they decide that that's what they want, and they want to get rid of a tyrant. If they're coming out there, like, these are our Bill of Rights. This is where we need, you know, like, here's something weird, like, culturally-wise. Like, you look like people like, yeah, oh, the gun sucks. Like, well, the rest of the world doesn't even have a Second Amendment. There's only like, maybe two other countries, like Guatemala or something, like in Mexico, and that's about it. Uh, it's a weird, radical thing uh, for even a government to think about, like, the people that can have guns. And just in case that you piss them off, they can shoot shoot back at you. Right. Right. Um, so I think like, if, yeah, if Venezuela was like, yeah, we want these individual liberties and we want to do this and we need help. Sure. But I guess if they're like, uh, no, it's just socialism was just done wrong. And uh. <laughs> <laughs> there's still a majority in, in Venezuela that supports Maduro. Right. So it's unfortunate. But yeah, they I think they have to learn the hard way. But it's just not going to work. And that takes time. And people hate to see people. You hate to see your kid, you know, struggle through a poor choice but it's better that they learn then right i'm fine with sending these revolutionaries some helicopters to help uh, <laughs> liberate their country but this is also like part of their story and sometimes uh you know people say like we or i but given where you are in generations past and the culture that kind of builds that up uh you're in other people's stories whether you want to be or not uh you're in that history whether you want to be or not and you can take up part of the tradition uh, to shape that in the future, right? And maybe some people did draw inspirations from what happened in America. That's why the French Revolutionary <laughs> Revolution occurred. And maybe that could be an inspiration for other places, but it's got to be them saying, I'm going to be part of this tradition and maybe to change it for the better. And I think that's the only way that you can have maybe something long lasting or something to take hold instead of like America coming in. It's like, all right, here's some Bill of Rights. You guys don't understand it. Uh, <laughs> Impose it on you. <laughs> Cato coming out here saying so. <laughs> here's some mini constitutions. <laughs> <laughs> Just air, airdrop them from helicopters, you know, instead of dropping people from helicopters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> When they've tried to do that, though, I feel like there are countries who tried to just go, oh, here's the Constitution, boom. You know, it didn't, I don't think it's worked out right. the same way that it worked out here. And it's, it's, there's other countries where I might go, if I went to France, I wouldn't be like, you need to put a gun in the hands of every single person here because that's not their priority. Maybe they're at a different stage where they need, okay, maybe you need to just support free market capitalism a little bit more, you know, in the ways that you can. To be fair, France changes its constitutions like every week. So oh. <laughs> they've been through five since like... Uh, Macron? Like five since like the 1800s. Oh. the uh, Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff Yellow might be a weird, unique thing in the United States because a lot of the stuff that it's been advocated for is unique in its own culture and against like the... Uh, aggressions and things that they had to put themselves through to survive. And it's like a reflection of those kind of environments and conditions. Um, 
like maybe this experiment kind of only kind of works here for the most part. Um, I always feel bad for like libertarians who you hear, you hear about from um, Ireland or France <laughs> right. or like these socialistic <laughs> European countries. Yeah. And you're just like, man, you, you're never going to make any headway over there. Like you should just come to the United States. Right. <laughs> oh. What's that? Scissors? You're arrested. <laughs> Bad opinions. All right, Facebook police. Uh, like they're so isolated from. <laughs> there's there's this guy in Britain who fended off this um, Muslim at- uh, attacker. On oh, this he's bridge. a right wing extremist. He's, he's a right wing extremist. Right. So like he's in the hospital, stabbed eight times. But the government worries now that he might not particularly like these kinds of people that were trying to terrorize people and stabbed him. And so they put him on a watch list that he might become an extremist. And he has to go through mandatory sensitivity training. Exactly. Because he got. Yeah, imagine that. Yeah, you're the victim yeah. of a crime, so now you have to do <laughs> sensitivity. Yikes! The next American Revolutionary War, we cross the Atlantic and finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> Megan Merkel is working on that. She married into the family. This is uh, for Pepin for uh, Revolutionary War Two, the Electric Boogaloo. Forty. So, what is the Boogaloo? My girlfriend was asking me the other day because <laughs> it's this meme. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been surging a lot I saw more a lately. Police, I saw a meme. It was a police sign, like a roadside sign. It said, no crime from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. <laughs> and then underneath it says, 601, the boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the boogaloo? Uh, the meme I found was, uh, you've been arrested many times for victimless crimes, so it's very difficult for you to even acquire guns, but the boogaloo occurs and God sends Jonas well over to un- to throw up all the guns that people lost <laughs> in boating accidents. <laughs> you can start the boogaloo. Can you lighten us? What is the boogaloo? What does Urban Dictionary say? <laughs> Isn't that like the name of it's a type of e- Latin dance. Song I don't something. know how you wouldn't know this. <laughs> It seems to be more of a uh, when shit hits the fan and government's coming at you, and uh, it's uh, like Ron Paul is showing up on your okay. f- on your front door. I got the, oh, yeah. <laughs> the top definition: a common libertarian meme referencing the overthrowing of government or author- th- authoritarian force by revolution. <laughs> it would have to be uh, a libertarian definition. <laughs> and cap, it's boogaloo time. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it was just, uh, you know, shit hit the fan, Tiatwaki. Right. You know that one? I mean, the end of the world as we know it. It's rooftop Korean time. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's my favorite. <laughs> my favorite one is um, this guy getting excited. He's wearing thermals and all packed up. And he says, like, when the boogaloo starts and they're going to your house, but you're right behind him. And, <laughs> 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 and they don't even know. <laughs> I woke up at 2 a.m. last night. I need to get something from the car, but I walk outside and hear gunshots. I see cop lights go by, and there's a police plane over my house. And I was like, "Did the boogaloo start?" And I not get the notice. <laughs> what must been like in like the American Revolutionary times, where like, like people are like, "Well, shit, there's a war." It's like, <laughs> right? Yeah, it took, I, I live mean, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right? I, I would have no reason to know about this. Right? Yeah. It's like uh, uh, there's no crows at this time. You know, this is uh, a Two lanterns in the in the lighthouse. Right? You have some guy yelling at two o'clock in the morning. Paul Revere. Paul Revere. <laughs> <laughs> British are coming, but well, we're British. <laughs> All right, I don't understand. Like, what's going on? Because it can't say like everybody knew about this declaration, what's happening. Um, maybe people the... barely know what's going on now, and we have the internet. All right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think during that time. Um, risky to join a lot of people gave up their lives and their states and everything and i guess uh it paid off and i think that if they were alive today they'd be upset by everything <laughs> that they see around us they'd be stacking bodies right yeah. <laughs> boogaloo time boogaloo revolution um i think that uh at the same time i guess how would the government respond to these people that are alive today and airing their own grievances similar to this. Yeah. I wonder if they would, I wonder if there are some things that they would see and be like, wow, okay, you actually managed to keep like the second amendment, you know, relatively, I mean, not as good as we might, we might've preferred, like you don't have tanks in right. your front yard or turrets on, on your, you know, the top of your house. But like people can pretty much buy a gun. It's still want. there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, Back then, you could own any weapon the government has, so I should be able to put my ICBM silo in the backyard. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Agree. Yeah. I think that um, there's, for the most part, I guess they would be uh, rightfully arrested by the federal government. No, the they terrorists. Wouldn't, they wouldn't yeah. be arrested. They're not guilty of a crime. They would go to a CIA black site. All right. Yeah. On vacation in Poland. <laughs> well, there was a black site in Chicago, I remember hearing about. In uh, Poland? Do they have a black site in Poland? You've said too much. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would think like the place they would go is Saudi Arabia or, or Morocco or something, right? That's like the, those are the black site destinations, right? Polacks or poles, I should say. They're they're too like they're too cool. Like they would never allow that stuff. <laughs> I think today we do have a Stanley military army. The police militarized. A lot of them have like their their like weird militaristic can- tanks. Well, they're coming from Iraq, so they're yeah, sure. Like we'll buy. I was like, for what? Like it's weird. Like the way police changed from like. Uh, that old um, dragnet, like community policing, yeah, to uh, the ODU police department when I was there having an up armored Humvee. <laughs> Still curious why they had that. I haven't seen any, you know, IEDs in my neighborhood. <laughs> I don't know why they need mine resistant right? vehicles. I'm just not convinced. What's that other TV show where it's like a good cop walk in the town had that jingle like Andy Griffin? Oh, Andy Griffin, yeah. thank you. Oh yeah, right. You didn't even wear the hat. Right, yeah. Com- yeah. And completely transformed now to like, stop resisting. He's like, I'm not <laughs> even doing anything. <laughs> I saw one video. This guy is in his car and he, and the cop's like, why does it smell like weed in here? And then he just pulls out his gun. <laughs> it's like, dude, it smelled like weed. You it's, not like, it's not like that's like the smell of a bomb about to go off. <laughs> I think that drives an interesting good point that uh, even like in the government eyes and even our eyes, like, in this area, maybe because of the oceans, we've never really been invaded except for our own government. But uh, we haven't. We've really enjoyed a great centuries of like peace, where there's really that much, not much adversity, except for whatever some people want to imagine, uh, having like these weird race wars within themselves. But it's a great time. You can you can do whatever you want here, and government also then has to create their own adversity here to kind of justify this sort of stuff. To make it seem like this is still like a struggling time and era here for for everyone, but you know, if you turn off your TV, don't look in Facebook, and you just do your day to day thing, like you really don't notice most of this stuff stuff at all. Um, except if you do do that, you'll miss out on the ways like the government sneaks in a lot of this weird stuff in our public schools, Common Core, and rearranging, uh, changing history. Like here, talk like in the Constitution, they'll say it's rearrange the Second Amendment. Uh, and reword the whole thing. Well, one thing you guys were saying is there were presidents before the Constitution. I wasn't aware of that at all. Right, right, right. (laughs) Weird, right? thought I thought American history started when the Constitution was made. Weird, right? (laughs) Anything before 1776 was a mistake. (laughs) No, it was correct. There's that mural (laughs) in San Francisco, the mural in San Francisco, where they're they're talking about painting over it because it shows Washington and, and a couple of various historical figures, and then it shows... Um, Indians and you know uh, slaves and and whatnot. So it's it's trying to re restate kind of what happened. And, well, let's forget about that. Yeah. Let's get rid of that. What's well, like the Betsy Ross flag hate symbol that has recently come up? Right. Um, and she was a Quaker. Quakers are fundamental at the underground revolution of uh, freeing slaves and everything. They were one of the first abolitionists out yeah. there in the scene. My family was actually Quaker. I'm related to Daniel Boone. Oh. So they were like prominent anti-slave owners actually in the South, which is weird. Right. Um, so they look at this sort of stuff. Well, they want to paint everything. Well, this is uh, Colin pa- uh, what, what's his last name? Kaepernick. Kaepernick, right? But this is a guy saying, yeah, this is all racist and oppression, but he wears like a Fidel Castro t-shirt. Uh, embodies oppression in Cuba. You know, my grandfather escaped from Cuba uh, for good reason. Um, risking his life and uh, against... Uh, 10,000 people dying in that sea between Cuba and Florida because of shark attacks. So, you know, you never hear anyone saying again, there's a common phrase like, nobody risks their lives to escape from capitalism. But oppressive slaves like Cuba, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that's a great flag. Uh, I mean, during that time for, for what it is, for independence, for declaring yourself free from tyranny. I mean, this is before the Constitution. This is before the United States government. This is when they all think, I'd imagine, that this is, yeah, for our own sovereign, for our own community, for our own people. Uh, we're different states, but we're united with uh, uh, wanting to protect our, ourselves, property rights, uh, and, and try to 
cut our own path to our own uh, divination of what is good in our own pursuit of happiness. And that's particularly important that you mentioned that the united part in the declaration is not capitalized. It just means regular, you know, that we United States as individuals. Um, so I guess, was it worth it? The British did abolish the uh, slavery in uh, 1833. So they could have abolished it earlier and prevent the Civil War. Uh, and they... And they went away the route of not using force to do it. Right. They actually bought out the slaves. Right. You didn't need a war. I you don't didn't need to kill six hundred thousand people. Right. To make it happen. Oh, weird. right. Okay. Uh, Indian relations uh, were better under the British. I think they had more like laws against uh, interfering with them. That's why they wanted to curtail the states for not expanding westward, which is interesting because George Washington was a land sur- land surveyor, and there's interesting real estate outside of Virginia that he would like to have. But you can't have it on a British rule. So you overthrow the British. What do you have? Prime <laughs> <laughs> real estate. Capitalism. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. You guys know why uh, DC is located where it is? He owned it. He said, the contingent of me being president, I'll do it. You'll have to move the capital here to this location because he owned uh, Mount Vernon in that area there. It dries up uh, the prices for him. So. Regulatory capture right off the bat. <laughs> Crony <laughs> capitalism. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a pain back then. You think about well, from a practical perspective, like if we were going to try to start a government, right uh, here, go all the way to like Philadelphia like, all the time, right? Or just like, all right, who's got the most property around here? Who wants to actually do this? Like, it, it was sort of a form. They probably viewed it as a way of public service, not as a way to enrich themselves. Maybe, as yeah. Much. He was already rich. You know, that's a good point. Yeah. So, any last uh, comments on the declaration? I think it was a great document for for what it is. I think uh, the grievances is something that never really been uh, what echoed anywhere else. It was a good start to show what tyranny is, and they outline what it looks like, um, and then they not just write about it; they they put their skin in the game and risk everything for that, um, and they came out on top. And they're remembered uh, in the annals of history of liberty. I think it's sad that the, the the problem with the Declaration of Independence is that it really is just a founding document. It's not doesn't really carry any weight of law. It's not really used by the Supreme Court when they're trying to figure out what someone meant by Ooh, such and such. A imagine thing. that, because that would I mean that would change everything, right? Right. So <laughs> unfortunately, uh, in that sense, it's just useful for people like us who like to you know, look at it and say, those are a lot of good reasons to leave a government. Can you imagine someone bringing that out in court? Or here says, uh, we're allowed to create our own legislation. Uh, here says that uh, you guys are militarizing. Here says that uh, we're allowed to secede. That's actually more the British style of government. They can use like different court cases and stuff like that. Uh, different documents to try to make the case because they don't have a written constitution. Their constitution is a collection of all of this stuff. Uh, the common law. Yeah, the yeah. common law. Huh. I can't imagine. Well, uh, thanks for coming, guys. It's been a, a good crusade. This is uh, Kamalani. Stay liberated. Get off my property. Build some guns. Taxation is theft. <laughs>